Welcome everyone. I see some people trickling in. Great. Well, I'll go ahead and start introducing myself and our speaker. My name is Lucy Wong and I am stepping in some really um, big shoes. Uh, Joe Ceremelli is out today. So he's asked me to do the uh, sort of hosting and moderating for our guest speaker. For those of you who don't know me, I am the Geriatric Psychiatry Fellowship Director at the University of Washington. So I'm very excited to kick off um, a geriatric psychiatry topic for our grand rounds today. This is uh, our slide here just to provide you some um, orientation and some acknowledgments. First, uh, how we handle questions. Feel free to just write your comments or questions in the chat. What will happen is at the end, I'll curate these questions and we'll have time to uh, go through some Q&A with Dr. Garcia Pittman. Um, again, acknowledging our great team, obviously Joe not here, but Semhar, Mike, and Charles for all their help and making sure this runs smoothly. And finally, acknowledging funding for the 2023-2024 series, which includes the Ripley Fund, the Garvey Institute for Brain Health Solutions, and Treatment of Mood Disorders Fund. So now I will interest you, introduce you to Dr. Garcia Pittman. Um, she is an associate professor from UT Austin Dell Medical School in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, and she serves as program director for the newly established Geriatric Psychiatry Fellowship Program there. She is currently the outpatient clinic director at Ascension Medical Group, Seton Behavioral Health, where she is the rotation site director for the resident, adult, and geriatric outpatient clinics. Dr. Garcia Pittman is an active leader in the American Association for Geriatric Psychiatry, or AAGP. She is the chair of the Resident Education Subcommittee for the AAGP Teaching and Training Committee, as well as co-chair for the 2023 and 2024 AAGP annual meetings. She loves working with families and caring for patients who are struggling with late life mood and anxiety symptoms, as well as changes in memory and behavior. And she has a passion for promoting health and wellness while minimizing medications with a focus on long-term brain health. I'd like to add a local connection she is a alumnus of our very own geriatric psychiatry fellowship program here at the University of Washington. So I'm very excited to have her back and introduce her now uh, to proceed with her presentation. Thank you all. Hi everyone. Um, thanks for having me here and uh, pardon me while I try my best to get my slides um, exactly where they should be. Um, I'm imagining I need to swap my settings. Is that looking good? Perfect. Yeah, that looks all right. good. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for allowing me to join you all. Um, um, as a former UW trainee, this is true, a true honor. Um, as a quick backstory, um, I completed my fellowship training there at Geriatric Psychiatry during the 2008-2009 academic year under the program direction of Marcella Pasquale. So shortly after I graduated, my husband and I moved back to Texas. I'm a true Texas girl, and we landed here in Austin. Um, so I joined a growing clinical faculty at an established community psychiatry residency program as the lone geriatric psychiatrist. Um, my job at that time um, was to grow a faculty practice as well as to train, uh, create training experiences for our residents in geriatric psychiatry. Um, so I founded our geriatric psychiatry training clinic in 2010. And as in, in 2021, um, we launched uh, the Dell Medical School, as we're now known, um, uh, our geriatric psychiatry fellowship program. So our training clinic has trained hundreds of psychiatry residents and uh, medical students in the years that, that it's been running. And I'm happy to share with you some of the lessons learned in our outpatient uh, management of bipolar disorder in our training clinic. Um, so thanks for having me. Um, I have no financial disclosures and I will discuss off-label use of medications. And I would like to thank my colleagues, including Dr. Tani Smith and all of our amazing Dell Medical School psychiatry residents who are involved in the clinical cases that we're discussing in today's presentation. Um, this lecture is really a compilation of prior general sessions that were presented at the American Association for Geriatric Psychiatry annual meeting. Um, I hope to highlight several challenging and complicated cases of bipolar disorder treated in our outpatient geriatric psychiatry clinic. I will share lessons learned from these clinical encounters and review clinical pearls related to the cases presented. Um, in addition, I'll share knowledge regarding literature updates as well as guidelines for treatment of the aging patient um, with bipolar disorder with a focus on mixed presentations. My learning objectives are listed on the slide. Um, and so now I wanna provide some background information regarding older age bipolar disorder. 
Um, epidemiological studies report that types one and two bipolar disorder affect 0.5 to 1% of older adults. Um, this doesn't include all of the individuals within the bipolar disorder spectrum and is lower than the prevalence rates reported in younger adults. Approximately 70% of patients with older age bipolar disorder are women, possibly because of increased survival rates. And don't forget, it's strongly suggested that there is an underestimation of the prevalence of bipolar disorder among all age groups. Only about 20% of patients of all ages who screen positive for bipolar 1 or bipolar 2 disorders reported that they had been previously diagnosed with the illness. Of the patients with bipolar disorder, 25% of them are 60 and older, and that number is expected to increase to 50% in 2030 because of the aging of the total population and greater awareness of bipolar disorder among older adults. This demographic shift highlights the importance of moving beyond extrapolating treatment recommendations from mixed age groups and developing specific recommendations for older adults with bipolar disorder. In contrast to the low rates in the community, older age bipolar disorder accounts for 6% of geriatric psychiatry outpatient visits. In fact, bipolar disorder is the most common condition that we treat here in our geriatric psychiatry outpatient training clinic. In fact, yesterday afternoon, we had a an entire afternoon of patients with bipolar, including several that um, were pretty manic in our clinic. Many of our patients are referred to our clinic following psychiatric hospitalization. Um, older age bipolar disorder accounts for eight to 10% of geriatric inpatient admissions with an overall prevalence of late life mania of 6% in older psychiatric inpatients. And studies in North America report that 3% of nursing home residents and 17% of older adults in psychiatric emergency rooms have bipolar disorder. Older age bipolar disorder represents a diverse group and includes persons with early onset as well as late onset bipolar disorder. There is no firmly established age cutoff for early onset versus late onset bipolar disorder but some investigators consider age 50 to be a reasonable demarcation. Late onset bipolar disorder also includes individuals with prior depressive episodes, but no mania or hypomania until late life. It's estimated that five to 10% of individuals with bipolar disorder will be greater than 50 um, at the time of their first manic or hypomanic episode. In a review of older adult bipolar disorder, the mean age of onset for any mood episode was 48, and the age of onset of mania was 56. Among hospitalized patients that were 50 and older, more than 29% of them developed their first affective episode after age 50. Somatic comorbidity is frequent in the older adult um, older adults with bipolar disorder, with an average of three to four comorbid medical conditions, including metabolic syndrome, hypertension, diabetes mellitus, cardiovascular disease, respiratory illness, arthritis, and endocrine abnormalities. This health burden is greater compared to persons with unipolar depression and results in polypharmacy and decreased mean survival of 10 years. Cognitive impairment is part of bipolar disorder and present in 40 to 50% of patients with older age bipolar disorder, even in the euthymic phase. These cognitive difficulties are in the domains of attention, cognitive flexibility, processing speed, memory, and fluency. Cognitive functioning is more impaired in late onset versus early onset bipolar disorder. There are several differences between late onset and early onset bipolar disorder in older adults. I will highlight a few key differences in the next several slides. In late onset bipolar disorder, family history of bipolar is less common. Um, they have higher rates of vascular or cerebrovascular disease, which can cause secondary mania. Late onset patients often have a quicker remission when properly diagnosed and treated and shorter inpatient stays. Older adults with bipolar disorder seem to have reduced symptom severity compared to younger populations. 
but they are more vulnerable to the consequences of our medications, including extrapyramidal symptoms. Additional differences include longer periods of stability between first episodes. In fact, there is a 17 year gap between first manic and first depressive episode for older age bipolar disorder. Older age bipolar disorder has reduced symptom severity compared to younger adults. This includes less frequent psychotic symptoms as well as less frequent suicide attempts. But compared to younger populations, older adults with bipolar disorder have more neurocognitive burden, including more frequent cognitive dysfunction. Perhaps differences in the symptomatology and the course of bipolar disorder lead to an increased risk for mixed symptoms in older adults. Older adult patients have fewer and less intense manic symptoms. In fact, they tend to have irritable mood during um, periods of mania or hypomania. They are more likely to relapse into a depressive episode and more likely to be treated with antidepressant medications compared to younger adults. They are less likely compared to younger adults to be treated with antipsychotics and lithium usage is less prevalent. Older age bipolar disorder persons are also more likely to have a rapid cycling course. So what do we know about mixed symptomatology in older adults with bipolar disorder? Few studies have specifically examined mixed states in older adults with bipolar disorder. In a study published in 2022, our colleagues used the Global Aging and Geriatric Experiments in Bipolar Disorder database to examine the frequency of mixed and manic mood symptoms in older adults. They found that mixed symptoms in older adult um, bipolar disorder were common with 70% of the global sample experiencing mixed manic and depressive symptoms. Nearly 16% of that older adult um, bipolar disorder sample had concurrent manic and depressive symptoms at a higher severity, so severe illness. Um, mixed symptoms were associated with poor everyday functioning compared to depressed only or manic only groups. And within the mixed group, depression, but not mania severity was related to poor functioning. As a reminder, there is no consensus of what might constitute mixity amongst older age bipolar disorder. And we have no specific cutoffs for our commonly used rating scales for mixed symptoms. The treatment of mixed symptoms and bipolar depression is challenging with limited medication options as well as the consequences of treatment. And we have very few clinical trials for older age bipolar disorder in any mood state. I know that many in the, in the audience have experienced the challenges related to the diagnosis and treatment of bipolar disorder. Caring for older adults with bipolar disorder can be even more challenging. Given the length of time between episodes, accuracy, concerns for accuracy of the history provided, and poor insight or poor recognition of mildly elevated or mixed mood states. Okay, so that's enough for the background. So I hope y'all are ready for some clinical cases. So we began with case number one, broken bones. Oh no. Let's start with GS. She's a 75 year old female with a prior history of depression, cognitive impairment and neuropathy, who was referred to our clinic from our colleagues in the psychiatric emergency department. She presented to our training clinic for a new patient evaluation with concerns for depressive symptoms, which included low mood, anhedonia, decreased energy, weight loss, and increased guilt. Pertinent past history included prior episodes of depression beginning in her 30s with two um, previous psychiatric hospitalizations. She was unable to provide details regarding prior med trials or treatment at that initial visit, and we did not have access to additional collateral information. There was a positive family history of psychiatric illness, including depression, eating disorder, and alcohol use disorder. Personal history included concerns for irritable bowel syndrome, neuropathy, hearing loss, as well as recurrent UTIs. She'd previously worked as a hairdresser, is now retired, and um, has two adult children. 
Her medications at that initial evaluation were duloxetine 60, trazodone 200, risperidone 0.5 milligrams, and dinepazil 10 milligrams. Isn't that a curious medication regimen? Okay, okay. You've been primed with the background information, so I, let's just see what happens. Um, without any additional information, and the patient, of course, denying concerns for mania, um, we gave her a provisional diagnosis of major depressive disorder, recurrent, moderate. Um, we increased her duloxetine to 90 milligrams to assist with her moderate depressive symptoms and discontinued her risperidone, given the risk for long-term consequences. And we recommended participation in our intensive outpatient program geared for senior adults. Um, we did not note any significant cognitive impairments or cognitive concerns on interview and the Mo or on the MOCA, um, but we elected to continue the denepazil at that first visit um, to limit the medication changes, but we had planned to discontinue it at future visits. Surprise, um, at follow-up, she returned to clinic with her daughter who had a bit of a different story to tell us. Um, both acknowledged no improvement in her mood symptoms since we increased the, the dose of the duloxetine and discontinued the risperinone. In fact, the patient began to describe some mixed symptoms. Daughter shared with us that the two prior psychiatric hospitalizations were not due to depressive episodes, but in fact, they were for mania. Um, and we also learned that there was a family history of bipolar disorder, type one, um, with her mother and granddaughter both being treated for that illness. So we changed the diagnosis to bipolar disorder type one, um, a mixed episode, um, but please note, this was of course before the DSM-5 update. Um, so we transitioned the patient from duloxetine to quetiapine um, with, with lithium for mood stabilization. And eventually the patient was treated with monotherapy lithium alone, 600 milligrams. Um, but in the meantime, she was she remained on the lithium and the quetiapine. Both the daughter and the patient described great mood stability with the new medication regimen and her participation in the intensive outpatient program. But then um, the patient falls and breaks her arm between appointments. We didn't hear about the fracture until our next visit. Um, she required surgery and was given hydrocodone, um, but she elected to take an over-the-counter agent um, instead to manage her pain uh, with her surgeon's approval, of course. Um, at our next visit, she presented with bilateral hand tremor and fatigue. So what do you think? I know, I know, it is, this isn't groundbreaking clinical knowledge, but every year we regularly encounter patients with the same clinical presentation in our training clinic. Um, and it's kind of one of the key and most important points that our residents learn um, as, they're, as they're participating in our second year outpatient experience. So no surprise, she was experiencing lithium toxicity. The resident obtained a, a serum lithium level and a repeat BMP and her lithium level was 1.0. Her BMP, including her GFR, were within normal limits, but we noted confusion and inattention on her mental status exam and performed a repeat MOCA. Um, there was an impressive decline in her total MOCA score, a reduction from 26 to 19, with prominent impairments in attention, as well as delayed recall on the, at that follow-up visit. Um, so what did we do and what happened? Um, well, we held her lithium and continued the quetiapine. Um, we educated the patient and her daughter about the interaction between lithium and her over-the-counter NSAID medications. Um, we asked her to return to clinic in one to two weeks and noted significant improvement in, um, in symptoms, including resolved tremor, um, fatigue resolved as well as, and as well as improved cognition. Repeat MOCA um, was a 23 out of 30. We eventually restarted the lithium without issue and her mood remained stable on dual therapy with quetiapine. Okay, and so now time for some clinical pearls focused on lithium use in older adults. Um, using lithium in older adult patients is trickier, uh, but it remains the gold standard uh, medication for our patients with bipolar disorder. Uh, for many of our patients, it's been a long-term medication, but we commonly initiate lithium later in life um, in our newly diagnosed patients with bipolar disorder. 
Um, as a reminder, we have several physiological changes that occur as we age that will impact um, the lithium treatment. One being a change in renal function, um, which will of course impact the elimination of lithium. As the creatinine clear as creatinine clearance declines, lithium levels will increase because elimination is reduced. This change in renal function is expected is expected in all persons who are aging. And we should expect to lower the dose of lithium um, as someone is getting older. We're also targeting, targeting lower lithium levels, ideally below 0.8 for management of bipolar disorder. In our clinic, um, we typically aim for 0.6 is the sweet spot, balancing mood stabilization and side effects. Why are lower levels preferred? Increased brain, blood brain permeability related to aging allows for a therapeutic response at lower doses. Um, in addition to targeting lower levels, we also want more frequent monitoring of lithium. Um, and, and so we're checking the lithium level, we're checking most commonly a BMP, um, but it's not unusual for us to uh, check a CMP in case we're considering other agents. And we recommend a frequency of every three to six months. We would encourage a transition from yearly monitoring to monitoring every six months once a patient transitions to the age of 60. Um, we also increase the frequency of monitoring depending on medical comorbidity, new medications, new um, cardiac conditions. Um, we recommend 12-hour levels for all of our patients and, and routinely watch the trend over time. So one point in time is not enough for us to give concern, especially if the, the level is normal. Um, because if somebody had a lower level um, uh, six months ago, it'd be really important for us to see that, that increase or rise in um, the lithium level. Our typical starting dose in our geriatric training clinic would range between 150 milligrams to 450 milligrams of lithium dosed once daily, typically given at bedtime, with the majority of our patients taking 750 milligrams or less, and commonly less than that uh, for the management of bipolar disorder. Um, this is very different to, uh, compared to adult dosing. In addition to those physiological changes that can be seen in our older adult patients, there are several other factors that can elevate the risk for toxicity. And illness is one of those risks. Um, so having an acute GI illness, COVID, we've had patients um, present to clinic with uh, symptoms of lithium intoxication, all of those sorts of things would put our patients at risk. We also worry about drug interactions with things like um, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, thiazide diuretics, and NSAIDs, which our older patients are more likely to be on. Older adults are more likely to have lithium toxicity, and we want to catch those trends in levels and renal function changes sooner rather than later, so we can make, make the appropriate changes in their prescribed um, dosage. Um, I, I mentioned targeting lower levels, and that's all what we're aiming for, again, is below 0 0.8. Um, and, and that's because our older adult patients are more likely to experience neurotoxic side effects at levels above that. Um, serum concentrations, when we get a lithium level, it's just a ser surrogate market for, uh, for brain levels. Um, but at, you know, as we age, it's thought that it's easier for our medications to cross the blood brain barrier and therefore having a lower serum level um, is appropriate for our older adult population. In our clinic, we maintain most of our patients in the range of 0 0.4 to 0 0.6, um, often because it's a good balance of providing mood stability and reducing the risk of side effects or toxicity. When you look at the literature for the cutoffs of the different systems of lithium toxicity, you'll see that the levels are way above one, uh, 0 0.8. And that's because these are all based on adult literature. So what we see is basically a shift in these cutoffs where a level of one or 1 1.2 can present as, as modern li lithium toxicity. Our patient's lithium level was 1.0, which is well below what we would typically expect for toxicity. And as you can see, her level of 1.0 caused symptoms of delirium, which is more in line with the moderate toxicity, much which, which we would expect for a level, an adult level of 2.5 or higher. I wanna highlight the importance of initial and ongoing lithium education, especially for our older adult patients. We often assume that psychoeducation is uh, provided the start of treatment, and then we don't have to do it again. But um, regularly repeating certain educational points will be important for all patients, but especially our older adult patients. 
as the weather starts to warm up here in central Texas, and it's still in the 90s here, we are reminding them of the importance of hydration. And at the start of cold and flu and now COVID seasons, we are reminding them of the interaction between NSAIDs. We're looking at ingredient level labels to make sure there's not any ibuprofen or naproxen in the, in the cold products that they're using. We also talk with them about how hydration is important with a GI bug or high fever. And we um, always reinforce these points before surgery. So if someone has a planned uh, you know, elective surgery or any type of surgery sc scheduled, um, we wanna make sure that they're reminded of this. And we've seen numerous cases of lithium toxicity following surgery in our, both our adult and geriatric um, clinics due to NSAID use after a patient's transition off opiates. Um, we also want our patients to be familiar with the signs and symptoms of toxicity, and we provide them with instructions to call the clinic if they're having mild symptoms, but suggest an immediate visit to the emergency room for confusion or um, more moderate symptoms. Okay, now it's time for case two, a bit of confusion. Oh, disclaimer, I know this picture is a little bit wacky, but this uh, photo was from December 2008. Me and my dance goes in Ballard during the epic snowstorm of 2008. Um, let's just say this Texas girl was a bit confused and unprepared for 14 inches of snow that hit Seattle that week. Uh, but let's focus on GR. Um, she's a 71 year old female with a history of bipolar disorder diagnosed later in life. Um, her first episode of mania was in the context of escitalopram initiation. She required psychiatric hospitalization for mood stabilization with olanzapine and divalproex. Following hospitalization, the patient's mood remained stable. She was able to discontinue treatment with olanzapine. She remained on divalproex monotherapy for nine months with valproic acid levels in the therapeutic range. On follow-up, um, the patient and her husband had noted new onset cognitive impairments occurring over the last several months. She was having more difficulty recalling names of past acquaintances and was confusing dates of past events. Both patient and husband denied functional changes, but both felt these, this change was different compared to her baseline. Um, during the encounter, we performed a cognitive screen and noted some mild impairments in recall. While we did not see significant impairments in attention, we were still worried about the potential for delirium and ordered laboratory testing. Um, UA, CBC, CMP, ammonia levels are all within normal limits. And we also rechecked a valproic acid level. As you can see, her total VPA was um, 98, and that was prior to the visit a long time ago, 2016, uh, which was um, in the typical therapeutic range for adults with a free level of 18. Repeat testing following that visit um, demonstrated an increase in the total VPA level of 110 and a free level of 20. After receiving the results of the valproic acid, um, we decreased the patient's dose of divalproex with plans to repeat the total and free levels. On return to clinic, her mood remained stable with the lower divalproex dosage. Patient and family also noticed improvements in cognition. Um, here's a graphic representation of her total VPA levels with a drastic difference in the total level following the reduction. Um, her, um, uh, so kind of a after we did the dose reduction, you can see that the total level is now outside of the typical adult range. It's now hovering in the low 70s. Her free and percent free levels are also decreased following the dose reduction with a final free level of 12. This is more in line with our typical therapeutic window for older adult patients. So let's get to some clinical pearls related to valproic acid use in older adults. Um, valproic acid is complicated. It's um, not one of my favorite medications. Um, and you've probably experienced this too, that doubling the dose doesn't get you double the level. Um, and that's because valproic acid doesn't have linear kinetics. Um, it's what we call curved linear kinetics. Uh, valproic acid is highly protein bound. Um, it binds primarily to albumin. And with dose increases of valproic acid, we will eventually saturate the albumin binding. Um, so that leads to more free, increased free and percent free levels, which represents the unbound portion of valproic acid. So why is that important? Why do we care? Um, only the unbound portion crosses the blood-brain barrier to exert its pharmacological effects. And it's also the portion that's free to be metabolized. 
In general, what we can see in our older adult patients is that higher unbound fraction, uh, as well as a decreased clearance, leads to higher um, than expected free levels. And that um, knowledge and is really what led us to shift our practice to regularly check free levels with all of our patients, all of our older adult patients. Um, in addition to monitoring free levels, we often recommend um, um, additional monitoring, free monitoring in persons with hepatic or renal impairment, as well as people with significant weight loss or low albumin levels, especially albumin levels of less than three. We also monitor free levels when our adult patients are experiencing neurotoxic side effects, but the total level is within the normal range. Or if the, if the patient's not responding clinically um, and, and their um, total level is within normal limits. Obtaining the free valproic acid level is challenging. Um, not all of our labs locally perform the test. Um, it's a send out lab. Um, even if we order it in the hospital and it takes five business days for us to get lab results. Um, so it is, a, it is a little bit tricky. Um, in, while in our adult population, we may shoot for valproic acid levels of between 80 to 125 in acute episodes. We're generally shooting for total level, total VPA levels of less than 80 in our older adult population. In our clinic, especially in the Jerry Training Clinic, we use the free level to drive our treatment decisions. Our lab provides a free range of, of valproic acid between five and, and 15. And for our older adults, we're typically aiming for eight to 12. Um, in our experience, free levels above 12 or percent free levels of 20 or greater, we start to see more consequences of treatment. So um, when should we get a level? That's often tricky. Um, there's often confusion about that in our training clinic. Um, as a reminder, 12 hour levels should be obtained if a patient's on an IR or DR formulation. And a 24 hour level, a trough level, should be obtained for people that are treated with Divalproic CR. And we do have some patients that prefer morning dosing, which uh, makes it easier for us to get a 24 hour level. Uh, but most, but many of our patients, and I would say the majority of our patients do take their uh, Divalproic CR at night at bedtime. So we can't really get a 24 hour level. Um, we recommend that our patients go to the lab at the end of the day uh, before the lab closes to get to as close to an 18 hour level as they can. Um, and it's really important for us to know what time that lab is drawn, um, no matter the formulation they're on, because it's going to impact our interpretation of, that, of the results. In addition to the differences in timing of the levels, we're also frequently asked about what other differences there are between the formulations. The DR formulation is an enteric coated product, which uh, prevents the release of medication for approximately two hours um, before that enteric coating dissolves. And then it essentially turns into an IR product. Um, with rapid absorption um, that's complete within six or seven hours. That's the reason why we need to dose the DR formulation twice daily. Um, so that's different than the ER formulation. That's specifically designed to dissolve and release slowly over 20, 20 to 22 hours, um, which allows for daily dosing. BID is not required nor necessary with the ER formulation. Um, ER formulation does have a slightly lower bioavailability, so you have to keep that in mind if you're switching from one formulation to another. Um, we most exclusively, mostly, um, use the ER formulation in our geriatric clinic, but for some patients, swallowing the larger ER um, tablet is troublesome. Um, it's a it's a big pill, um, and so we for some patients, we do need to switch over to the DR version, which is smaller in size, and it also has the availability of the 125 milligrams in the sprinkles. Um, a typical starting dose in our clinic, in a training clinic, um, would be somewhere between either 250 or 500 milligrams dosed once daily, typically given at bedtime, with the majority of our patients are taking less than 1,000 milligrams a day. Um, actually, more of our patients are within that 500 to 750 milligram range uh, for the management of bipolar disorder. Um, again, this is very different compared to adult dosing. And as a reminder, both lithium and divalproex are both studied for the treatment of mania um, in older adults in a groundbreaking Jerry BD trial. Both treatments are considered efficacious in this night week trial with comparable tolerability. As you can see, the mean dosing range is again lower than what we'd expect for adult patients. 
and the mean serum concentrations were also lower compared to typical adult, adult therapeutic ranges. And now we'll move to case three, which highlights how proper recognition of fixed features leads to a new diagnosis of a late life bipolar disorder. Our patient, AU, is a 67-year-old Hispanic female with history of major depressive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder who presents with her husband for a virtual appointment in the outpatient clinic. This was during our COVID era. Um, her first encounter with, with a psychiatrist was in February 2020 when she was voluntarily admitted to a psychiatric hospital for new onset severe anxiety and sleeplessness. Um, there, she was diagnosed with MDD with psychotic features and GAD and discharged an escitalopram at 10 milligrams daily, as well as a lanzapine at 10 milligrams at bedtime. She was stable on this regimen for about 10 months. And in December of 2020, her symptoms returned after completing a course of oral steroids for an upper respiratory infection. Her escitalopram and olanzapine doses were both increased, but unfortunately, her condition continued to worsen. Um, in June 2021, she was involuntarily admitted for failure to thrive after losing about 30 pounds. After an extensive uh, medical workup was negative, a psychiatric di diagnosis of that first hospitalization was, was held, was, uh, um, was upheld. Um, so she remained treated for um, MDD as well as GAD. She was ultimately discharged on duloxetine 30 milligrams daily, mirtazapine 45 milligrams at bedtime, and a low dose gabapentin three times daily um, for anxiety. This brings us to our clinic appointment two weeks after discharge. Um, here's a complete list of her medications for your reference, and she was taking those medications daily. Um, uh, both patient and her husband reported that the hospitalization nor the medications were really helpful. Uh, she reported four months of terrible anxiety and depression. She was endorsing ongoing racing thoughts, sleeplessness. Um, she was getting less than four hours a night of sleep for weeks and daily panic attacks. Her husband revealed that she was always pacing around the house due to anxiety. Um, she endorsed decreased appetite. It lost over 30 pounds in a few months. When she, when she was asked about her eating, she kept saying things like the muscle of her colon was weak. And that was the reason why she wasn't eating. Of note, she had a pretty unremarkable social history. She denied any history of trauma, substance abuse, and had a supportive family. She also denied family history of psychiatric disorders. Um, Moving on to pertinent mental exam, uh, status exam findings, her speech was monotone, her responses were quick and at times impulsive, um, answering before the resident even had a chance to finish asking the question. Her behavior was restless and distractible, and she would look around the room and ask, can I go yet? Um, there was like there was some sense of urgency. Her affect was described as constricted and dysphoric. Um, and she expressed passive suicidal ideation and somatic delusions related to digestion. Um, the measurement-based tools at this visit were consistent with severe anxiety and depression. This included a geriatric depression score of 14, a geriatric anxiety inventory score of 20, and a modified MOCA was performed um, to accommodate the, visual, uh, the virtual encounter, and she scored a 17 out of 22, losing points for attention and language. At this point um, in the appointment, the resident was uh, feeling pretty confused. Um, despite considering a broad differential diagnosis, things didn't completely fit. And for your context, the resident would like you to know that this was her second intake in our geriatric training clinic early in her PGY2 year. Um, so I'm going to leave you with that as a cliffhanger and um, as we take a break from the case to discuss diagnosis and screening of mixed states. Um, as many of you know, there's been a pretty big change in the diagnostic criteria of mixed states between DSM-4 and DSM-5. To qualify for a mixed episode according to DSM-4, you must have simultaneously met full criteria for a depressive um, and manic episodes. Um, and so that really can only occur with bipolar 1. DSM-5 reconceptualized mixed states by getting rid of the mixed episode and introducing mixed specifiers um, to MDD, bipolar 1, and bipolar 2. That switch allowed us to be more uh, sensitive to the spectrum of mixed states as they were thought to incorporate um, clinical implications that, 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 that led to many patients being missed, um, misdiagnosed. Um, because of that stricter DSM-4 criteria. So to qualify for a mixed specifier now, um, you have to meet full criteria for whatever mood state, plus three or more symptoms in the opposite mood pool. Um, so what does that mean? Um, so, so 
we've listed the DSM criteria for mania, hypomania, and depressive episodes. So the resident thought, okay, a MDD with mixed features must mean that you meet full criteria for a depressive episode, meaning five or more from the right column with three or more from the left column. But that was actually incorrect because the list of symptoms that count towards the specifier is shorter. So she's crossed out, we've crossed out the symptoms that are excluded. So there's certain things that are excluded. These overlapping symptoms are um, excluded to prevent overdiagnosing of the mixed state because it's common in both depressive and manic states and therefore not specific enough. That being said, those overlapping symptoms are not insignificant. Instead, distractibility, anxiety, irritability, and agitation, sometimes referred to as the DAIA symptoms, have been identified to have important implications for mixed states. This is because they're among the most common symptoms of mixed states and because they're positively correlated with severity. In fact, our patient exhibited all four of the DIA symptoms, but the absence of elevated mood grandiosity and pressured speech initially reduced the resident's suspicion for a mixed state. Um, the resident initially thought that the, um, the, DI, the DAIA symptoms were more suggestive of, of an anxiety disorder. But looking back, it distracted her from recognizing that the patient also met three other symptoms um, um, that met the criteria for the mix specifier. After recognition of these additional symptoms, she diagnosed her with bipolar one disorder, current episode manic, with mixed features and mood congruent psychotic features. She ended up meeting full criteria of the mania and depression, and she is by default diagnosed with bipolar one. Um, to, to improve the diagnosis of mixed states in patients presenting with depression, we re recommend using a probabilistic approach where the accumulation of these soft signs and clinical history, treatment history, and current symptoms should increase your suspicion for a mixed state. And with regard to our patient, um, things that eventually raised our suspicion for a mixed state included her poor response to antidepressant medications, the presence of psychotic symptoms, and the present of, presence of all four DAIA symptoms. Um, one potentially useful screening tool we found that incorporates the probabilistic approach is the rapid mood screener. screener. We found that the, um, this unique tool um, that includes soft signs for bipolar disorder in addition to the typical screening questions for manic and hypomanic symptoms. It's estimated to take less than two minutes uh, for a patient to complete and gives better specificity and sensitivity when compared to the mood disorder questionnaire, the hypomania checklist 32, and the young mania rating scheme. So to wrap up the case, here's some brief updates. Um, at the intake, we discontinued duloxetine since traditional antidepressants can be destabilizing in acute mania and started quetiapine for treatment of our mixed mood state and psychosis. We chose to continue gabapentin and mirtazapine at that visit to avoid making too many changes at once. At our subsequent visit, we uh, quetiapine was discontinued due to side effects and olanzapine was started and titrated to 7.5 milligrams. Um, mirtazapine was discontinued. Unfortunately, treatment was complicated by a worsening psychotic symptoms in the context of a delirium secondary to a UTI, and that led to temporary discontinuation of olanzapine. Valproic acid was started at that time and um, treat after the UTI and resolution of her uh, delirium and olanzapine was restarted. And by month four, um, the patient was mood stable and doing really well. And that was her final medication. Okay. One last case before we wrap up for questions, and, um, and it's titled Mixed Messages. Um, our patient's a 67-year-old woman with long-standing history of depression and anxiety, which did not responded well to treatment, including two antidepressants. At her initial visit, she had been experiencing the following symptoms for the past six days. Um, as uh, previously discussed, our patient um, met full criteria for manic episode and is experiencing several symptoms concerning for a mixed state, shown in red. Um, she had also developed paranoia, believing that someone was trying to come into her home to harm her. And prior to the week of presentation, just, she described a two-month history of depressive symptoms, along with irritability, severe anxiety and panic, social withdrawal, and hallucinations of shadows and her peripheral vision, as well as hissing noises. On further investigation, she reported a 12-year history of similar mood cycling. She had been remotely diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but had never um, 
been treated with a mood stabilizer or antipsychotic. She had a family history of bipolar disorder and multiple relatives, as well as a brother with schizophrenia. And she denied any history of substance abuse and was well supported by family. We diagnosed her with bipolar disorder type 1 and current episode manic severe with mixed features and psychotic features. Our primary goals were as follows. Uh, discontinue the agents contributing to mood instability, treat mood symptoms, limit polypharmacy, and kind of reassess her cognition once her mood stabilizes. Our first medication, our recommendation was to discontinue the two antidepressants and initiate a mood stabilizer. We chose valproic acid over lithium due to the patient's history of cardiac and renal problems. The dose was increased to 500 milligrams due, due to a low free level. Um, and dual therapy with the typing was planned, but was deferred to her next visit to limit uh, medication changes. At week four follow-up, mixed and depressive features continued. The typing was added. VPA levels, both free and total, were persistently low, and valproic acid dose was increased again to 750 milligrams. There was a concern for potential non-adherence, but the patient and family provided us assurance that the, she was taking the medications as prescribed. She was referred for psychotherapy. By month two, um, symptoms and functioning were improving. Valproic acid was continued at 750 milligrams, and quetiapine was optimized to 300 milligrams for bipolar maintenance. Uh, so, you know, taking a, a break, um, when we're thinking about treatment of mixed states, um, use of antidepressants without mood stabilizers are contraindicated, and certainly two unopposed antidepressants in this case is not ideal. Um, mixed states are notoriously difficult to treat and often require dual therapy with a mood stabilizer and an antipsychotic. For refractory cases, ECT is an excellent option. Um, 68 to 80% of patients with bipolar depression respond to ECT with, with adult, older adults, of course, having higher response rates approaching 87%. And ECT response rates across depression, mania, and mixed states um, have, been, um, have been studied and found to be comparable, although there's a trend for mixed states requiring longer treatment courses. Um, Choosing the best initial agent involves balancing several risk factors, comorbidities, existing um, medications, patient preferences, affordability, review of the evidence. Um, the CANMAT guidelines are one helpful source that we use regularly in our training clinic when treating patients for bipolar disorder. And there was a recent update published in December of 2021 that focused on the tr treatment of mixed states. Um, it's important to note that the study, the CANMAT data used um, adult data. So recommendations are not specific to older adult patients. Uh, but of course, there's a dearth of high quality data in mixed states. There's no agents that met the threshold for first line treatment. However, there are several second line treatment options that were proposed. And those are shown there on the slide. In our case, we selected valproic acid, um, which could be particularly useful in mixed states, but does require considerable monitoring given its potential side effects. Um, prior to initiation and regular intervals afterwards, we obtained lab work, including a CBC and to, uh, to rule out thrombocytopenia, a dose-related effect, a CMP to evaluate liver function, and bo both free and total serum levels. Um, and so to return to our case, um, the patient experienced significant challenges over the last, uh, the, over the next many months. She was lost to follow up and struggled with medication adherence. She restarted an old supply of bupropion. She went off of valproic acid and quetiapine, likely due to a combination of mood and cognitive symptoms. Her physical health declined. She had several trips to the emergency room, was found to have an extremely elevated TSH in the 70s, which was when it was previously in within normal range. We discussed options for simplifying her regimen while addressing her symptoms. Um, Alanzapine was selected due to patient preference and affordability. After a month, her mood improved um, with her GDS uh, of a five and her functioning began to improve. Um, at the last time of review of this case, her medication regimen included Alanzapine five with plans to consider lithium after discussing with endocrinology and cardiology. Um, some of you may have noticed that we didn't exactly follow the CANMAC guidelines um, as Alanzapine is not there. Um, you know, I'm sure many of you have encountered that in clinical practice that the best medication for the patient is often the medicine that they can afford, they're willing to take and works. Um, there's frequent barriers in our psychiatric practice, of, especially when using newer medications. Um, and we have to really think about who it is we're treating in that moment. Um, so my final thoughts, just as a reminder, you know, bipolar should always be on the differential for older adults. Mixed symptoms are common. 
um, and are often mixed, missed, um, we should be using a probabilistic approach and considering uh, those DAIA symptoms. Both lithium and valproic acid can be safely used for the management of bipolar disorder in older adults. We really probably should avoid antidepressants. They complicate the clinical picture. Um, don't forget the toxicity can occur at normal adult dosing and normal adult levels. Um, and remember to use smaller amounts of lithium and valproic acid, increase the frequency of monitoring, aim for lower levels, use free VPA levels, and trend those level changes over time. And here are the references, and you can have access to those afterwards. And I'm happy to answer any questions you all might have. Thank you so much, Dr. Garcia Pittman. I uh, can certainly say I've learned a lot, and my radar is now heightened to look for mixed states. I'm a little worried. I'm one of those people who may have misdiagnosed a few people, like like your case, to where it, it that was the case. So, uh, thank you for that. Uh, I'm now open to accept questions. There actually are a few already in our question to answer box. Um, the first is a comment on your first case where uh, you know, a patient with uh, bipolar depression was started on quetiapine and lithium concurrently. So the question was, you know, why not just lithium alone? Why the two in combination? And I do have sort of a related question um, or sort of follow-up. I am interested in your take on how to treat bipolar depression because I find that very difficult in older adults. I would. Um, be open to how, how you do it in your clinic or your approach. Um, um, yes, those are all kind of important and interesting questions. We have the privilege here of having access to therapy services, including intensive outpatient programming, which has been really helpful for our older adults um, in kind of in navigating this. I think it's really hard. Um, we have limited options for depression treatment. Um, we know that lithium works for depression, right? For people with MDD, our patients with bipolar disorder. And so we are not, we don't shy away from it. But oftentimes when we initiate a traditional mood stabilizer, whether it's lithium or valproic acid, we're not ready to do it at the time of that first visit. It's much easier for us to initiate an antipsychotic. We commonly use quetiapine as our agent of choice just because of the data it has in all of the states. So it has great evidence in depression as well as mania, as well as you know, continuation or maintenance treatment. Because we can start that more quickly, um, you know, we need to get things like an EKG and, and, and labs in order for us to safely prescribe lithium. And it may take us many weeks to to get to a therapeutic level. And so we want to not ignore those symptoms while we're waiting for the lithium to become therapeutic. So when you when we're getting the level, we're getting a level a week after they initiate. So if we've started at 300 milligrams, a week later, we get that initial lab, it's low. So then we increase it again, and then we check it another, so it's another couple of weeks. And then, um, and then we want to make sure it's at steady state. So we actually do two points in time to Firm that they're actually at a therapeutic level. Lithium response for depression it takes weeks to get the full response. So we want to, if somebody, especially our older adult patients are failing, and they often are because they might be frail and losing weight um, and not functioning, we're going to do everything in our power to treat them kind of at that time. So dual treatment, um, there's, there's, there's benefit for providing that in the short term for our patients. Another related question is a question about lamotrigine in um, old age bipolar disorder. I, I guess it did, was a mood stabilizer that didn't show up in your slides there. Right. Any thoughts on that? So perhaps that's my bias, um, and and it's my bias for for a couple of reasons. One. Um, the lamotrigine data, there, there's certainly no role for any um, elevated mood states. So it is not going to be helpful for treatment of mania. And if you're really thinking about mixed symptoms, I'm not sure how helpful it's going to be because the, the had multiple fail, the, the trial to failed. And in treatment of acute depression, there's mixed evidence. Um, so it's not actually a, a super powerful agent um, for those acute depressive episodes. It has the best data for that and a continuation or maintenance treatment um, to prevent future episodes, but not really so strong um, in the acute stage. But the but the biggest kind of barrier to it, it just takes too long to initiate treatment. So if somebody's acutely depressed and kind of failing and 
maybe starting to become psychotic, waiting for a six week titration to get them to a therapeutic level with the hopes that maybe it'll treat depression. That's not the, that's not where I like to go. Um, and so we much prefer to use quetiapine, looking at something else that potentially could get them better faster or ECT, of course. Um, um, and so that, for those reasons, we're just not using it much as much. We once somebody is stable, and if they're not somebody who's a mania um, person, we may consider transitioning them over um, over to lamotrigine for that kind of uh, maintenance treatment. But it isn't something we use as commonly in acute. Uh, we have another question uh, relates to differential diagnosis and cognitive impairment. What is your protocol for differential diagnosis of, say, frontotemporal dementia versus bipolar disorder, and also Lewy body disorder and other psychotic disorders? Um, I think I have a sort of related you know, observations that many of us are a little anxious to diagnose bipolar disorder if someone has a first episode uh, mania in late life. And so we're looking for all these other um, right. uh, alternative diagnoses and how do we rule those out? So I appreciate your, your take on this. Sure. I think my bias, you know, uh, you know, our clinic, our training clinic here is a general clinic. So we see everything um, kind of in our, in our geriatric population. And so my bias is like, I would rather them have a mood disorder than a kind of a terminal illness, uh, like a, a neurocognitive disorder. Uh, but I think that that's a really important question. Like, so, you know, for us, it's always the geriatric psychiatry, it's the three Ds, right? So is it delirium? Is it, de is it, is it depression? Is it dementia? And we treat those things first. So is there something reversible? So we're doing the entire reversible workup. I want to see neuroimaging if this is really the first time they've had symptoms. Many of these patients have already come from our, our psychiatric hospitals. My colleagues have already done that workup. And so we're not doing it so much in clinic because they've already done the workup for us. Uh, but we would certainly do that entire workup first. We would target and aggressively treat mood symptoms, whatever the symptoms they are, um, and, and then we reevaluate cognition at once mood is stable. And so then that would include neuropsych testing and all that sort of stuff, but you really don't want to send someone to neuropsych testing if they're mixed or depressed or whatever. You're not, it's, it's, it's not a great baseline, um, kind of assessment. Um, but I think all of those things are important on the differential. And it happened as you include MOCA on um, pretty much all or most of those cases. So I appreciate you giving us those examples of what you include in a workup and, and monitoring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, the objective rating skills and, and uh, kind of cognitive um, assessments are part of our normal intake process. So we, they always get a geriatric depression scale, geriatric anxiety inventory, and a MOCA, um, or some sort of cognitive assessment if they're going to be with slums or whatever it might be. Um, and we do that yearly here. So our patients as they age are at risk. And if we don't screen, we won't know that there's cognitive impairments. We have one last question uh, just snuck in, and it actually not, not necessarily about bipolar disorder, but uh, lithium level you would target for depression augmentation in older adults. What's your take on that? That's a good question. I don't, we don't actually have tons of data on that, um, but certainly you don't need to be aiming for that 0.6. So, so that would be less, 0 0.4 or less. And um, that's what we would do for adults. So there's no different for older adults. We, you know, I, I don't think we have any reason to be kind of slamming them with lithium. Well, we are at, right at 12.59, close to one o'clock. So thank you again, Dr. Garcia Benton for joining us and for everyone who's attended. Uh, I, I learned a lot. So I, I really appreciate all your, are you sharing your experience and, and uh, skills and, and understanding and knowledge. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you everyone for attending. Thanks, Yvonne.